slide says that the joint EIS is in a draft environmental impact statement. That document covers both the terminal, the environmental effects of the terminal, and the pipeline. Um, Even it's an interesting word because at uh, one point in time, I was predicting we'd see a draft environmental impact statement in April. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that, uh, October is the is the current anticipated uh, publishing of that thing, and FERC is tentatively scheduled uh, some public meetings to accept comments on that draft environmental impact statement in the first four weeks of December of this year. Uh, the uh, because it's a the terminal component is a is uh, applied to liquefy natural gas and, and export. The U.S. Department of Energy is the federal agency that approves applications to export natural gas. And the government has been approved by DOE to export gas both to uh, free trade partners in the United States and non free so those, those approvals were issued by, by DOE. DOE does that analysis. Uh, is the project, can they approve the project based on price of gas, market conditions, the amount of gas available in the United States for export? Uh, FERC just approves the specific installations and the environmental effects of those. So I have a question. Can you sure. ask me questions as to go? Yeah. One that I have is would there be any Canadian? Yes, coming down to the right Um Let me jump to the next slide. Perfect time to do uh, This is a map of, uh, of the existing uh, uh, infrastructure. I kind of put this up here uh, kind of to introduce, you know, we're uh, with Williams Engineering Construction Williams. It's an energy company in the United States. Uh, Williams owns in blue there the Northwest Pipeline. Um, but on this map, I believe right there, that little dotted line, I'm sorry, it's so small and hard to see. Uh, that is the uh, gas transmission northwest of the GTN pipeline. That's Malin right there. Uh, the, this map doesn't show, but the Ruby pipeline comes in and hits Malin right there as well. So the Pacific Connector would have interconnects with both those pipelines. So gas could come down from Canada over to Coos Bay that would find the ship, or gas could be nominated and acquired off the Ruby line. So uh, there's there's two different sources. Does that bypass the Northwest Pipeline? Um, yes, the, the Northwest Pipeline is not interconnected with Ruby. Okay. Um, this the Northwest Pipeline is just it's just there to show the extent of the existing pipeline over 50 uh, years in operations uh, owned ultimately by by Williams and we, we built that pipeline in the late 50s, early 60s and it delivers gas. It's actually by direction of gas can come out from Canada, gas can come out of all these these different basins and we uh, transport gas into Washington, Oregon, six states in Idaho, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming. So that's Williams has been doing interstate pipeline in the very first time. <laughs> So we've been doing interstate pipelines for a long time. We're used to working in the Pacific Northwest, so that, that's really the, the basis um, why that slide was there. This is the Pacific Connector route, so I guess I'll have to be the, uh, I'll have to be the point now. There's the Moline area, and the red line is, is the proposed pipeline route. This map is out of the application. It's to be obtained off the first website, or I'm sure it'll be in the uh, draft EIS. Doesn't show BLM lands. We can see Jackson County here, and we, we cross a couple of forests in in the county. Pipeline is 232 miles long, um, and there is a proposed uh, compressor station here in Klamath County. It's the only compressor station in the project. Um, and then I kind of just wanted to give a, a permit update, so I just created some. Some slides I already talked about the FERC process, the draft environmental impact statements pending, you know, probably well aware of the process, draft impact statement, public comments, goes to a final impact statement. If the, if the uh, impacts of the project are not significant after mitigation, then FERC will issue what they call a certificate of public convenience and necessity. 
the, they issued a schedule, so we, based on that schedule, we anticipated the second and third quarters next year. If they're going to issue a certificate, that's when it would happen. With the EIS lagging a little bit, that's why it's second or third quarter can even predict exactly where. There's a bunch of permits we have to apply for and have applied for for this project. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers and 401 water quality certifications have been applied for. A lot of the permits, both federal and state, that permitting agencies don't want to start their processes, their public notices, and public meetings until the DEIS has come out. So uh, that's, that's true of those permits. Uh, we filed an application, and uh, a lot of these permits are joint for the terminal and the pipeline. We filed a consistency determination. The, uh, about 55, 59 miles of the pipeline on the west side is in the coastal zone uh, in Oregon, managed by the Department of uh, Land Conservation and Development. We filed a coastal zone consistency uh, application. They accepted that application, which just means we're in the queue, and ultimately they would process that application if we obtained the underlying permits that required. Uh, BLM's a cooperating agency with FERC, Forest Service is a cooperating agency with FERC, BLM will have to issue us a right away grant and a temporary use permit for temporary uh, right away. Uh, Forest Service uh, will issue us, uh, they're actually the right away grant will cover the, the pipeline easement across their lands. <coughs> we have, uh, we've had a lot of meetings with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. You guys probably know more than I do about the endangered species in, in Oregon. We saw it out more than we know that, just to name a couple. Uh, so we've had a lot of meetings and a lot of negotiations with Fish and Wildlife Service uh, about what a biological opinion for this project would look like. Uh, not, we're not as far along with National Marine Fisheries. We'd like to enter into an agreement. What we've done with a lot of agencies, BLM, FERC, Forest Service, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, is we fund a third party contractor. Because uh, agencies can't control their workload, anybody that wants permits and, and decisions from them come to them in mass. And in order to have any kind of efficient processing of your application, sometimes we have to provide them labor. The, the contractors work for them, we just pay the bills. So we're trying to get a similar arrangement with uh, National Marine Fisheries uh, to look at their issues and, and concerns about uh, the project crossing of. Uh, at the state level, uh, Oregon Department of State Names, we filed our application for uh, removal of fill. That application was accepted, but it can't be processed until the terminal's application is accepted and the terminal. Boy, this is just a lot of, a lot of regulatory mumbo jumbo. And, and before the terminal, they have to, have to go through the FSEC project, the energy facility siting, uh, for the parts of the terminal that aren't regulated by FERC, which is a power plant. Uh, some other processing facilities that, that first doesn't regulate. Uh, so we'll, that's a joint permit that will be processed together. Uh, we've been talking with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife about uh, in-water glassing because we have to do any glassing or permits you have to obtain for that. Uh, the fish passage, working with them to comply with the fish passage regulations and just how we do the, the crossings in general. Uh, we filed uh, water withdrawal permits with Oregon DNR for water withdrawals in the coastal zone uh, because if you're familiar with the coastal zone, this doesn't really concern Jackson County. Uh, there are a whole bunch of state and federal permits that have to be obtained in order for the DLCD to make a decision on whether or not we're consistent with the coastal zone. So that we filed some of those permit applications for just the coastal zone portion of the project to uh, exploit that. Then last week, we will be filing an air permit application uh, later this year or the first quarter of next year for um, the compressor station. Now we're in Jackson County, so you folks were around. This, this project has been around for six, seven years. Started out as an import project. The route in Jackson County has not really changed all that much. Any changes being made have been done where we've been uh, able to talk to landowners and make some slight adjustments based on landowner uh, input to the route. But from the big picture, that map I showed you, the red line, you would never see those changes um, at, at that scale. 
And I, I just threw in something about, I thought, well, if we're in Jackson County, you might have a question about, you know, what are your, your impacts? And I pulled off, and I think this is pretty much the same as the project that applied six years ago. Uh, we've got 77 locations where we're crossing either a stream or river or stock pond or something in Jackson County. About 30% of those are on Forest Service or beyond the rest are on private properties. The uh, Rogue River is exactly the same crossing location, the exact same technique, horizontal direction drill. I believe this committee did an analysis of our Rogue River crossing five or six years ago, Frank Lang. Different. And so that, there's no change to that whatsoever. Nothing new, nothing changed. Uh, for the most part, these are the same rivers and streams uh, and the same techniques, dry, dry, uh, where we're not doing uh, the HGDs. Uh, their work area isolation, you cross your work area is dry, past the water, past your construction. And you have fish uh, protection for salvage get the, the pipeline in, put it all back together, and then either remove the, the dam and pump structures or the, the refueling structure. So, so it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty standard, pretty much the same project in Jackson County now that it was five, six years ago. And I think this is my last slide on environmental stuff, but I don't want to jump forward if, if you have questions. You want to just hit me with questions while I'm standing here. Yeah, I have a couple questions, one of which is, I, and some of this, most of this went on in the committee, or a lot of this work when, when you talk about uh, crossing rivers, great streams, you go under them, you put the pipe within the confines of the water, or how, how does that physically accomplish? The, the pipe itself crosses under the, the street in every case. We don't, we have not proposed any spans. For the Rogue River, it's a horizontal directional drill where it's actually drilled. Um, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, so take it with a grain of salt. I think we're 70 feet, 70 or 80 feet below the bed of the river when the pipe goes up. We're using that technique, that HDD technique. For other smaller streams, um, if they're flowing, there's a couple techniques. One's dam and pump. You, you set up pumps, and, and there, there are a lot of, of work area isolation things you put in. Uh, but you'll, you can uh, bypass the water around your construction zone with the pump. Then you do, like I said, you do fish salvage, you're, you're, you're screened. So the, you don't have fish screens in place. And then you basically you might have to you might have to pump some of that water. Basically, you've, you've got a, an isolated puddle. So you pump that water to an upland area. You dig your trench. You install the pipe. You do all your restoration. Then you, then you stop the bypass and let the water flow in. There's a similar technique, it's called fluming, where you basically just pass the water through uh, a flume and you work underneath the flume. So. One of the question was, we have historically every 300 years had some pretty catastrophic severe earthquakes. What kind of mitigation um, programs do you have in place for um, in case the, uh, the whole project was was examined uh, by a geotechnical firm, geoengineers. So the first thing you do is you you look at all mapped faults and you look at all mapped uh, uh, landslides. Slides. You see the landslides and those kind of things. So your question is about earthquake. First, you look at all the at all the mapped faults. If the, if the mapping or the, the data about an individual fault is not sufficient to make a geotechnical design decision, you might go out and do some borings or some trenching to define whether the fault's really there, whether it's an active fault or inactive fault. Uh, inactive faults and really long uh, interval types of faults really aren't an issue. Um, and I'm not a geotechnical guy, but Basically, once you get a string of steel pipe, it's very flexible. So just ground shaving is it's not a problem. What you want to avoid are, are slips and changes in elevation. So in, in, in areas where there's a concern, then there's their design uh, uh, mitigation measures. Basically, it's select backfill, wider trench, and you do things so that the pipe's not confined 
under those conditions and it can move around, it has room to move around. And so that's that's all done by geotechnical engineers. And that work has been ongoing. Specifically. So is there isolation uh, check valves Good zones? Question. Yeah. And, and the, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Transportation has regulations that require the spacing of block valves and, and that's not it's not just for, for geotechnical things like this, but it's false. It's also for uh, cer just certain distances just to isolate the pipe in the different segments so that if there is an event, you can isolate and close valves and, and minimize the amount of gas so that could be released. Yeah. They're, are they going to be electronically operated? They are, they are electronically monitored, but not all electronically operate necessarily. They're all, but they're they're all monitored. What's the average depth or the depth of the pipe from ground? Uh, minimum minimum pipe depth under DOT regulations is 36 inches. Um, <coughs> in uh, agricultural fields, we usually go at least five feet unless the land owner can own the crop. You know, that, unless there's a reason. Uh, Depth is, is, is a standard of five. Wow. Uh, the design depth for crossing over streams, a lot of lines, it's like five feet below scour depth, which is calculated. So it really depends on, on what's going on on the surface. But, but just the, the minimum burial depth is. You're right away when you would be clear that all, the whole group would score. Yeah, the, the plan is, is to maintain a 30 foot wide. Uh, Herbaceous right away, so it could have it could have you know, shrubs, grasses, yeah. just not trees in that 30 foot. But beyond that, uh, it can be planted with trees as well. What what will the access be on the right away? Right? Only allowed for the company personnel. That's I mean, it, we don't want people traipsing up and down the right. Landowners don't want people traipsing across their property. So. So we don't we don't we don't want anyone to access the right of way except for the, you know, it's the landowner's land and our technicians uh, and so that that's our goal. It's, it's sometimes difficult in the, in the world of ATVs we live in. We, we try to the fences are always replaced. Uh, we we try to come up with with solutions to to eliminate ATV access. Where we can. Sometimes it's an ongoing process. After it's been, we find a, a place where it's it's an issue, and we, we may come back and work with the land. And then it's probably on federal land. On federal land? Yeah. It'd be the same thing. It's, I mean, it's uh, the, the BLM and the Forest Service basically they'll grant us a right of way, but where they don't want folks on that right away, uh, they'll, they'll tell us that there'll be, there'll be controls to the extent you can't control it. it it's, not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily a problem. And, and I give an example, our, our pipeline crosses Archie National Park and North West Park. And, um, people, people like to hike the right away, and the Park Service doesn't discourage them. It really kind of depends on the land use and force it to be on that. It's not our, it's not our preference to have uncontrolled access to the And then I missed, uh, when was the environmental draft EIS? Uh, October, right now. They, they, they've been, uh, it's, it's been slipping a little bit because of questions that the FERC has asked internally. And that's next month? Yes. Yes, okay. yeah, I'm guessing yes, it would be the middle of next month. All right. Unless they have any more questions. Well, like you said, it's yeah, be a I, I, I mean, I was in conference rooms telling people it was going to be April and it was going to be May. <laughs> so I, I, my usual answer is I don't, I don't predict the future. Why <laughs> did you have to go through the whole process again when you went from an export to, or an import to an export? Um, um, it was, it was first decision. The, uh, you know, we felt that the right away, the, the, the pipe doesn't care which direction the gas flows. It's the same pipe, it's the same right away. 
um, and we had proposed to FERC to just let us file an amendment. Um, but for whatever reason, FERC decided to vacate the certificate that it had issued for the import term and the So we had to see that again. 36 inches. So I presume the pressure changes at different points along the line or no, not? It's designed for an MAOP of, you know, they often have to 1,450 or 70. It, it'll leave Milan at about that pressure. Right. But the, mm -hmm. and, the, and the pipeline is, is designed that that's, the, that's what's called the MAOP. So the, the valving and the operation of it won't allow it to exceed that pressure. Uh, but there'll be many places where it's actually at less pressure. Okay, 1,400? 14, I think it's, it's either 1450 or 1407. Yeah. That the and that's, that's the maximum the pressure maximum allowed. allowable. The it's, delivery, they design it to that, but they're not going to operate at that. Right. Uh, and that's the, a safety the, thing. The delivery pressure at Jordan Cove is 800. So why did they initially need a pumping station halfway along? And now they don't need a pumping station. Uh, it's it's uh, it's hydraulics. When gas was flowing from Coos Bay to Malin, it's uphill. From Malin to Coos Bay, gas is flowing downhill from you know point to point. And the compressor the compressor station at Malin with that differential is enough to deliver 800 pounds of pressure to Coos Bay. And how many big cores are you putting in? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I knew there were these are questions I couldn't answer. The total number of pig launch you receiving facilities? I believe it's two or three. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's no more than that, I think. Do you know yeah, me? I, I think it's two, right? There's two. There's two. There would be one at Clark's Branch, one on Dave's place. And then, well, of course, one at each end. Yeah, but yeah, so within yeah. the facility. Can you explain what a pig port is or what a pig does? I wish I would have brought some more stuff. Um, well, sure. Uh, a, a pig is uh, is an electronic tool. It's for inline testing. You run uh, you run a, a, a inline inspection tool. These things are uh, pretty amazing. The, uh, they use the same guidance system as a cruiser. It tracks to sub, sub centimeter accuracy where that pig is at in the pipeline. In different configurations of, of pigs, they, they look for different things in the pipe. Some measure the mobility of the pipe, others uh, uh, do its uh, magnetic inspections of the steel, look for any wall thickness changes of the thickness of the steel, any anomalies, something that the computer and the data indicate could be uh, a, a crack, any, anything that it deems is suspicious, it, it looks for those things. So it's like a little submersible, like a little submarine? It, it really is. That's a good description. I mean, I've seen, I've seen them where they're nearly as big as long as the, this table, both of them put together. Um, and, uh, and and I've seen others that are maybe just the size of this table, and, and that, that's really pretty amazing technology. And like I said, there's different configurations for different applications, mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. And what a big launching receiving facility is, you need to have you need to have access to the pipeline, you need to have a long enough it's called a, well, the launcher, it's called barrel, and it's just got to be long. It's, it's where you insert and then launch the pig into the pipeline. So it's a piece of pipe on the surface and you put the pig in, or if the pig's coming at you, that the pig winds up at that location. But that takes people on site to both it does. install both, and both to the launch, Both to launch it and to receive it, and it takes people along the pipeline who have handheld instrumentation who are also documenting it as it passes um, it's kind of like a quality assurance check, and, and they have above ground monitoring locations that are all used to check the accuracy of the computer and that thing to make sure that when it reports uh, 
and say electronically, you know exactly where in the pipe that anomaly is. How often do those gates the, go to the pipe? The DOT requirements that once every seven years you have to do the pipe. So if you had pipelines under wire fires before? Oh, yeah. oh, and how do you deal with that? Um, the, the, the main issue with a, uh, a pipeline uh, during a wildfire is just coordinating with the operations folks. So that if the uh, firefighters need to cut in a new road or anything they're doing, that, that what they're doing doesn't dig down to the pipe. The fire itself, and there's, there have been studies where they've measured soil temperatures and then temperature at depth. There have been studies of wildfires and hardwood forests and, and conifer forests, and the, the, it's just not an issue for the pipeline. Three feet of <laughs> soil is a really good insulator. You know, three to five feet of soil, you don't have to worry about the pipe, but you do have to worry about somebody out there with a, a D9 cat dropping a river blade and pulling the pipe up to the surface. That, that would be a problem. So they coordinate with our operations folks, in fact, our, our district folks. And, if not that was down uh, at the end of the UPAC meetings, I mean, our, our operations district folks meet with the county uh, uh, emergency services people. We do training. You know, they, they, uh, we're all on their call list. They're on our call list. And they coordinate so that if, if there's a fire on the northwest pipeline right away, that our operations guys immediately call and go out in the field, meet with the, the firefighting crews. And, and, and help through, you know, where's the exact location of the pipe. They've got instrumentation where they can stand and tell you where the, where the pipe is exactly. So. so when you go through a BLM or Forest Service ground, do you typically sell the timber? They sell the timber themselves along with the um, you're, you're, you're You mark the right of way and they mark the right of way. It's how that ultimately we, have, we haven't done the timber contracts yet. You know, we, we, want to, we want to be certified to cruise for Forest Service so we can give them a cruise volume and then the contract will buy the timber. We'll be subject to the same limitations that anybody doing whole, taking federal timber uh, are subject to all the same uh, uh, limitations and regulations, but no, it would be done as though the contractually as though it's a two percent. Does that answer your question? Uh, it sounds like it's very it well, it, it, it's variable as to whether they're going to let us cruise it yeah. or they cruise it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's and, and you're, you're just on the cusp of where my job ends. Yeah, job yeah, because I can tell you that <laughs> the way we're doing it is the way they told us we're going to do it. We we asked them if if it could be a sale of timber versus a timber sale, as in we're putting in a pipeline not really wanting to buy timber and sell it, but uh, they pretty much told us this is the way you're going to do it. We said yes, sir, because it's the government requires it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so are you going to talk about <clears throat> the width of the, on the uh, right of way and such as that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's me <coughs> coming up. It's better to up the hook again. Yeah. Another speaker. Oh, that's something better. But we can come back to you. But yeah, I think yeah. Okay, which button do I press? Uh, just the end. All right, I just wanted to make sure I knew what button I'm pressing. Um, again, my name is James Goudreau, and uh, I'm with the Land Department. And I know this is an environmental meeting, but people are part of the environment, too. So we thought we'd, we'd give a little presentation about uh, the land. Um, uh, my presentation today, I'm basically going to go over, it's like four sections. I'm going to do kind of a schedule overview. I'll talk about land right acquisition, what we're acquiring, uh, and that will include the size of the easement. Uh, I'll talk about how we do our market value, and that basically puts a value to the rights that we need to acquire. And then we'll talk about timber, because uh, I know that's important in this area. So, um, And go ahead and stop me if you have any questions. Uh, I tend to talk a little fast sometimes when I'm up in front of people, so I'm, I apologize ahead of time. Um, I'm going to start with our schedule. So far this year, what we've been doing in 2014 is basically what we've been doing for the last six or seven years. Um, we're still requesting survey access from landowners along the pipeline because a project like this, we have a million different types of surveys we need to do, and none of them can get done at the same time. Um, so we're also, a lot of owners have given us permission, and we're, you know, we notify them 
hey, we're coming out to uh, do this type of survey. Is it still okay if we come out? And we'll make sure we open or close gates, et cetera, et cetera. Because uh, there's a lot of, I, we have a huge line list with all the different things. You know, owners are nice, but they all have different requirements. Um, we, we, we've started gathering uh, information about local permits, uh, you know, road crossings, uh, railroad crossings, uh, canals, communication sites. Uh, we have a few, the valves, the big launcher and receivers, uh, our compressor station, um, our meter station, our metering station. So we have, we have several above ground facilities, so we've got to talk to each county and, and find out whether we need a permit for the fence, a building permit, grading permit, et cetera. Again, this is kind of an area that's right in between Randy's job and my job, so we have to communicate and coordinate to make sure that we don't let any permits slip through the cracks. Um, <coughs> anyone got any questions about permitting before I move on? Um, so in 2015, um, they'll, we'll just continue on with the survey activities. Based on some of the, you know, how long the permits are taking and whether they're going to be on schedule or not, we're likely to start acquisition of some kind next year, whether that's full-blown acquisition that will include Jackson County. We don't have an answer right now, but we're likely to start acquisition next year. Um, in 2013, early part, we did the option program and we went out and we gave owners an opportunity if they wanted to, because they were tired of dealing with us and not actually getting any money, we gave them an option to sign an option agreement for, and, and we had we had about 8% of owners that chose to accept the option payment. And uh, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that uh, will be coming up next year is those two year options are gonna start to expire. So we'll have to exercise them or, or uh, renew them for another term. Did you say eight percent or eighty percent? Eight percent, and and it was it was it, we had reduced our scope to begin with even because we didn't go after large timber companies or large owners with large timber because we we didn't want to deal with timber yet we weren't ready in two thousand thirteen I mean we're still gathering data now so uh, there's a lot with the timber uh, timber and we just weren't ready at that point so um, that's what this year's schedule is looking like and after that you know I, I'll, I'll defer to the larger project schedule because uh, our schedule is, is very dependent on other groups and other permits and things so uh, I'm just going to keep it kind of basic um, from the land rights acquisition um, we, we've got I, I'm going to go over these parts we've got the easements, I'm going to discuss what generally an easement is. I got the different types of easements we're going to need on this project. Uh, what we're doing right now from the pre-acquisition standpoint, there's a lot of data that we gather. Um, and I'm going to go over the valuation process, uh, talk about kind of how negotiations work to a broad overview, and I'll talk about what we do during construction. Um, okay. Uh, land versus land rights. We're not buying land uh, except for a, a few, like the compressor station. Uh, we bought the land where the or the project bought the land where the the um, actual facility in Coos Bay is going to be. And there may be a few other locations along the way where it makes sense to buy a parcel as opposed to an easement, depending how we affect it. But generally speaking, we just buy an easement. And uh, what that is, is we buy a right from a landowner for a specific use of their land, which is to own and operate a pipeline. And so we buy some of the rights, but they still retain ownership of the land. And so we just have the right just uh, like everyone, I mean, if you buy an access right or something, the same sort of thing. We're, we're buying a right to, for a specific purpose. And so we have to value that. Um, and our permanent easement, that's what we're looking, that's the definition is we're buying an easement that it allows us to maintain and operate a pipeline and it reduces the ability of the owner to, to, to do something on the surface that would affect or impact our ability to maintain and operate our pipeline. When you boil it down to the simplest terms, that's what it is. You don't want someone building a house on top of a pipeline, not only because it's 
not where you should have a house, but also because we can't get to the pipeline through, you don't want us digging in your living room to get to our pipeline. And that's just the way it is. Um, it is an easement, not a right of way. They're interchangeable these days, and definite. Some people say right of way, some people say easement, but technically it's an easement, not a right of way. Uh, a right of way is more to do with roads, and it, 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 it's a very fine line between the definitions, but we're an easement. Uh, we've been asked a lot what can timber companies do on the pipeline right of way? Well, Rod, uh, uh, Randy kind of answered some of that, where the inside 30 feet, 15 feet on either side of the center line of the pipeline, there won't be any trees there because uh, it makes it, again, it's difficult to get to the pipeline and interferes with our ability to maintain and operate our pipeline. But the outside 20 feet, they'll be able to replant the timber there. So uh, when we do the valuation, we're obviously going to value that 30 feet in the middle differently than we do the outside 20 feet because it, it, they bought the land to grow timber, and if they can't grow timber there, obviously we've adversely impacted the future use of the land. Um, so the types of easements we're going to need on this project, we're going to need uh, a permanent 50-foot wide pipeline easement. Uh, we're going to have a per permanent above ground facility agreement for each one of our block valves, metering stations, and uh, our compressor station we actually are uh, going to buy that piece of property. Um, we're going to need temporary permanent and, and uh, temporary and permanent access road agreements. Uh, we're going to get staging and pipe, pipe yard leases for uh, along railroad tracks is a good example where uh, they're going to rail in our pipe and things like that. Uh, toward the end of the project, once they decide where, we're going to get uh, permanent product protection agreements where we're going to run like zinc ribbon or, or drop deep wells or something methodically protect our pipeline and basically run a, a current down our pipeline that protects it from erosion. So, um, and then uh, communication agreements. This is another thing where uh, we could very well be back in the county is depending on whether we're going to be able to put our needed communication equipment on existing towers or whether we may have to, there's talk that we may need to put up a couple of new communication towers. That's the counties are usually heavily involved in that step. Um, any questions about the easement types? Yes, sir. So it's, it's a 50 foot easement, but it's a 30 foot no tree zone. Yes. Okay. Yes. Normally we do 50 feet, but because we're in a temporary, we, we realize that we want to reduce our impact to the, the overall tree growing industry. So 30 feet is what we felt was a compromise. It was safety and operations of the pipe versus the landowner's ability to do what they actually have the land to do. Quick question, do you have any uh, limited domain rights? Currently, no, but uh, the, uh, the FERC, uh, when FERC issues the, the, the certificate, uh, we do have that, but uh, we typically do not use it as much. I mean, it's not in our interest to use it. I mean, it's bad. It's bad for us um, as well as it is for the landowner. So I mean, we make every effort to negotiate. And historically, we've actually fallen, followed through and condemned 1% of the landowners for Williams pipelines all through the country. So we usually work out deals with about 99% of the people. I, I mean, I don't have the crystal ball. It's a new pipeline in a new area. so. It could be different this time, but his, history says that we very rarely do, and we have thousands of miles of pipe to statistically back that up. So it is not our preference. Will this be a Williams owned pipeline, or is, how is Pacific Connector connected with Williams? Williams is a partner in Pacific Connector. So uh, I honestly have, I haven't seen the agreement. I so it's a partnership. Under the terms of the partnership, Williams will be the operator. It will be the, the operator. Williams will operate the pipeline. So they basically, you're basically formed to put the pipeline deal together, and then they're going to control the, the pipeline. Yeah, the, the pipeline is a, is a two-company partnership. The same company that owns the terminal owns 50% of the pipeline. Thank you for the help. Um, 
Okay, the pre-acquisition process, this is kind of what we've started this year in preparation for next year. We've been collecting uh, market data. We've been doing uh, title, gathering title information. We've been preparing property exhibits from the information we've been getting for the surveys. Uh, we've been collecting existing land use information. Um, and we've been working with uh, ACRT to uh, complete timber appraisals. Uh, it's a lot of work. What it's basically going to come down to are the offer packages that we offer to the landowners. And I'll kind of go over that again here a little later. Um, our commitments to the landowners is uh, we're going to be fair and equitable compensation based on the existing land use and how we might impact that existing land, land use. The amount of land that's affected and if there's possibly some severance and, and on some of these properties out here because of topography we may only be we may be taking up the only available building space it may be a 10 acre lot but because it's on the side of a mountain there may only be an acre of you know or an acre and a half of buildable area and because we're going through that area the whole value in that may be one of those areas that i'm talking about where i, I mean we're not going to leave an owner and say oh we're only impacting an acre so here's one acre uh we look at the whole property um we, we, we take the market value and the timber value um, and, and so when any other damages uh, will be addressed uh, before we start construction, uh, we make sure that we have local communication, we maintain local offices. Right now there's one in Medford and there's one in Roseburg and in the future there's likely to be one in uh, somewhere in Coos County and somewhere in Klamath County, likely Klamath Falls. Uh, we have our 800 number that's active right now, and it will be through the life of the project. That's the 866 number. Uh, you can also find us on the web at PacificConnectorGP.com because this is going to be a long-term relationship. We're not building this pipeline going away. Like Randy said, we're going to operate it once it's in place. So it's important for us to build good relationships, not only with the landowners, but the counties and all the other permitting agencies because we're not going away, so we want to build good relationships with everyone. Um, the market value process, we've hired Colliers International. Uh, they've been doing the market study. They go out and they get comparable sales uh, based on the land types. Um, they're doing a market data study for us. We're not doing, at this point, we're not doing an appraisal for each piece of land. We're doing a regional market study. You know, they're taking a look at the employment, the population, the real estate trends, uh, the immediate market areas are used. So we're not we're not getting land from around Portland. We're looking at comparable sales right here in Jackson County and Coos County, Douglas County. Um, we're analyzing the different parcels types that we're doing. So they identify relevant physical characteristics. Uh, assessment information, size, zoning, and land use. So those are the critical things in the study. And um, they help us determine which comparable sales they would recommend we use for each type of parcel. They give us a bunch. And then one of the things we do, Peggy is gonna do, is she goes through and matches the, the parcels that we actually do cross with the study because the study is independent of what we do. So we have to go through that independent study and figure out which values compare to the parcels we actually cross and then that's part of what the negotiations with the owner is. So we go and sit down with the owner and we say, we found these comparable sales and this is what we think the property value is roughly and then we work from there and we give the whole study to the landowner. So if the landowner looks at it and says, well, I think my property is more like this mark, you know, comparable sale and this comparable sale and you got the value wrong, well, that's something we'll talk about with each owner. But we give them the exact same tools that we have so that way they can make an informed decision. So that to me is, is what's important when you do, because landowners aren't, uh, you know, not, they're not real estate agents. They're, I mean, they need the information too. So we try to make it as accessible for them as it is for us. That's part of what's in the offer package. So for the timber value process, um, we've gone out, we've done the survey, uh, we have ACRT, which is a, a, they're a timber company that is experts in putting value on timber. That's basically all I know. And uh, they've helped us. They've gone out. We've marked the right-of-way. 
they've gone out and looked at the trees in the east, the proposed easement area, and they've started putting values on it. They're looking at the timber that's going to be affected. If we have to widen out an access road, you know, around a curve or something for the pipe trucks, we have to cut down trees. That's been added in. Uh, they're looking at the harvest tax. Um, you know, we're looking at mitigation part, uh, properties, uh, the NSOs and marble mirrorlets, which and that's kind of Randy's oh, area. Pardon me, what was the name of the mitigation? Uh, ACRT. ACRT? Yes, uh, it's an acronym and they actually have, but uh, honestly I was calling ACRT so I couldn't honestly tell you what it stands for, sorry. Uh, you know how those things are, you just start throwing them out and someone says, hey, what's that mean? I, I have no idea, I saw it on a business card once. I'm sorry, uh, but I can get that in from Peggy can give you that information. I'll look up right now. Okay, the negotiation process, which I think is really important, is we're going to make a written offer from day one to every landowner. It will be in writing, it's going to be in the offer package, in writing to every single owner. Um, so we don't negotiate in public, but every owner gets a written offer if they choose to share it with their neighbors, they're welcome to, because every single owner gets a written offer. So they could all get together in the coffee shop and compare notes and they're going to find that we did all the numbers exactly the same way because that's what we stand for is consistency. We're going to explain to each owner the project impact on their property. We're not going to tell them it's going to be no problem. We're really going to show them pictures of construction and we're going to tell them exactly how we're going to affect your property. Um, we're going to talk to them and find out additional information that they'll provide that could affect, you know, it's their property. We don't know and we haven't really had in-depth conversations with them. If we find out there's something more special about their land, it could affect what we do. We're going to offer signing incentives. Um, we haven't fully developed that out yet, but that is going to be part of our offer packages. We're going to offer signing incentives. And, uh, and we're going to, as we negotiate, owners are going to have stipulations. I got to move my cattle. I need a temporary fence, et cetera, et cetera, depending on their property. We put together a list of those so that way we can make sure that any commitments we make during acquisition, don't just stay in acquisition, they actually happen during construction. Um, so during the construction process, this can be more than a year after acquisition. We go out and we notify the owners. Part of the FERC process, we have to mail a letter, but we do more than that. We call, we go out and we meet with owners and we say, construction is gonna start, and here's the date it's gonna start, and this is when it's gonna start in your area. Um, we work with the construction uh, crews to make sure that all the agreements, stipulations that we made during negotiations are followed through during construction. Uh, we follow up with landowners as they have concerns during construction because there are always concerns. Uh, we work with landowners and construction crews to make sure that the restoration is completed as we agreed, which is another bone of contention that tends to happen with these things. And we keep landowners updated as construction schedules are updated and changed because construction schedules are always updated and changed. Um, and here's our current contact information. And if anyone has any questions, that's my presentation. Do you deal with auxiliary effects like that? How long are these pipes? 30 feet? 40 feet? 20 feet? Um, they, I think we're talking eight. I know they come in 40, but I think we're talking 80, yeah. right? Ian? We're going to do our best to get 80 foot joints in. Get okay, 80 so foot you're joints. getting an 80 foot piece of pipe in there, you don't just bend it around the corners. Mm -hmm. you gotta, you're starting to talk in Dean's uh, <laughs> shop here. Um, okay. Yeah, no, no, but uh, I mean, Dean, uh, I mean, a lot of those, they field bend some of them, don't they? But a lot yeah. of the really big bends, they get pre assembled, right? We, they, they will field bend. With a 36 inch pipe, you can feel bend that up to about 25 degrees. And when, when we do the preliminary survey, we, we endeavor to make our bends so that they can be field bent. Because an induction bend, which is around 16 feet long, will cause that 80 foot joint pipe. We try to get away from induction bends and go with field bends. You know, one of the concerns I have is that my land is obviously going to be affected by that. Um, and you can get the hay fields and stuff like that. It's going to have a reduction. The loss of use for a while and a reduction of use for a substantial period of time. 
while. Yes, sir. And maybe it could be for you know, three to five years. It I could think. be a lot longer than that. The okay. right top soil is not for that. Oh, I, I, I agree. So, I and mean, you could have a huge uh -huh. reduction in crop yield, whether it be hay or corn yeah. or whatever. Oh, I agree. So, how do you compensate landowners for that unknown? Um, well, there's a couple things. One, we uh, we uh, we topsoil segregate and and uh, through agriculture, and, and we we do a pretty good job typically of putting the topsoil back. Um, what do you do with the soil that is displaced by the pipeline itself? You look for a place to dump it. Amazingly, there won't be any. I have been totally amazed over all the years I've done pipe, how you can dig those things up, and when you put it back, it's all gone. It, it amazes me. But there'll be very little soil removal. There'll be some rock removal, and that's a whole different ball game when you're dealing with moving rock. You have to bring soil back. It makes a huge difference. But there'll be very little soil displacement. As a matter of fact, typically we end up with sometimes, especially if the conditions are right, we have the exact opposite. You get subsidence where it sinks in a little bit, which is really weird. But uh, which is maintained by operations and fixed. Yeah, I mean we, we go out and we fix that, but it happens from time to time. Um, but the other thing is, is typically when we're negotiating damages, we, we work with the owners, and and I know especially for crops that have owners or farmers that have been there for a long time there's historical data of yields from their fields. And, you know, uh, typically, I mean, right off the bat, we usually do at least three years, uh, depending on the crop. Obviously, some crops, it takes longer for them to get back up to where they were. Uh, we do acknowledge that that, that happens, and, and depending on the crop, we have actually pushed damages out five, at least five years that I know of. I've done those personally. I wouldn't be shocked if maybe there were a couple times where we went farther, but typically, after three to five years, that the from from my experience, the farmers say that they've reached back to their pre-construction yields. So um, typically, yeah, we'll we'll do 100% crop damage the first year, and then we'll work with the owner to come out with the appropriate calculations of of what they think the crop loss is going to be year on two, year two, and year three. And, you know, et cetera. But that is something that we address during um, negotiations. And if it's a if it's a crop we haven't dealt with before, we'll hire we'll hire a local expert. I we've done it before. Yeah, <laughs> that crop is a little different. But uh, no, but but for the legal crops, we'll uh, we'll hire if we have to. We'll hire a local expert. You know, uh, we just did a pipeline a while ago where they went through barley. And we didn't know anything about barley, so we had to bring on somebody who knew something about barley so they could help us figure out what the prices were. But a lot of times, you know, you go to the co-ops, you talk to the county, you talk to the landowners, and there's a lot of data out there on how much yields and crop values and costs are. And, and usually, we, 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 I mean, we make every effort to pay. We don't want the landowners to, to, to lose out, so we make sure we get the right value for the crops. Great communication. Yes, sir. Yeah, I do. Uh, back on the condemnation. Yes, sir. You said uh, Williams has had what, less than one percent, or about one percent. Yes. Uh, of that process to run all the miles of pipeline. But uh, we're going to find out here that some people just don't run water. Here. I, I. And yeah. uh, and for whatever reason, you know, yeah, uh, I'm not going to want it. And no matter what, how much money you want to give at it. And uh, and so. I, my my feeling is 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 um, <clears throat> uh, honestly I I uh, I'm I'm pro landowner rights. I mean I, I, I believe in landowner rights, and that, as a matter of fact, that's why I have this job is is I feel that it's important to make sure that there's a balance between the need of infrastructure versus landowner rights, and that's something that I believe in really strongly. And so um, I don't take it personally if landowners don't want the pipeline or they disagree. What my job is to do is make sure that they make an informed decision and they know completely the pros and cons of both choices. Because every owner, it, the owner drives the process. They have the decision, they can work with us or they can choose not to. Um, it's, not an, it's not 
PCGP's job to decide whether this project is in the interest uh, of the country, that's FERC's job. Once that decision's made, my job is to educate. Um, and that's strictly all I'm doing. I, I'm, I, I understand, I, I understand folks who don't want the pipeline. I, I appreciate that. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to change their opinion. I'm trying to give them the information they need to make an educated decision because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I feel that a lot of people are making decisions based on crappy information. And so I'm going to give them as best I can all of the tools they need to make their decision. And that's, that's all I can ask for them, is to sit down and hear what we have to say and get the information and make an educated decision. Because I hate later on, I, I've had some experiences where one of the few people we had to get, well, if I would have known that, I would have, and it was like, well, if he would have just sat down with us, and even though he didn't like the project, he at least heard what we had to say, maybe we could have worked this out ahead of time. And so that's really what I tell a lot of people who are really ardently against the project is like, I understand you're ardently against the project, and I respect that, but please take the time to make an informed decision and hear both sides of the story and then make your decision. Because if it doesn't change your mind, it doesn't change your mind. And just a quick follow-up question. I mean, since this has been going on for seven years, and that one is going to be the yes. same for an ally store. So you've pretty much identified everyone on the property owners that will be impacted by the pipeline? Yes, sir. Um, there have been some especially with access roads and pipe yards, there very well might be, because it's been so long and some of the pipe yards we looked at before or now, you know, the timber companies using it now or there's a pond on it or so. So, I mean, there might be some slight adjustment, but yes, for the most part, we have identified every single owner that is so impacted. So the landowners know that. Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. So once this is put in, how much difference in the look from the existing pipeline that exists already? I haven't personally seen the Avista uh, pipeline right away. Uh, I'm sorry. Is it around here? I mean, is it something like that? Yeah, it comes go? from Mallon into the Rogue Valley. That's how we get natural gas. Okay. Um, honestly, I, I, restoration, obviously, when it goes through the, th the trees, there'll be a 30 foot section where it's, it's low vegetation versus the high vegetation, and then the outside 20 feet, the trees will be smaller for what a while. What about weeds? Um, we do regular. Uh, maintenance of our right of way where they go out and I mean but we, we have to do a noxious weed survey prior right. to construction and then we'll go out post construction follow up surveys uh, depending on how and so if you go to an area that's already got weeds and the weeds they're invasive they're going to try to uh, so we if, if they can be depends on how they can be controlled I mean, some, some things like uh, in, in, in Washington uh, a, a right away where we've had to get rid of Japanese nut <coughs> that's actually an inoculation into the root by a certified weed uh, control person. But you, you identify the conditions, you follow up post construction, and you treat an infestation. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like any other construction project. We're going to have to deal with so much. That's what you should do is go look at the Avista uh, pipeline. And I don't know if you that question. Say, go look at the Avista pipeline. This is what it looks like 10 years after it's been done. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. 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 I mean, because I, I know from other jobs that we, we do a good job with restoration. I mean, obviously, when it's going through the trees, you see the gap in the trees. That's mostly what you see. Do you do a, a socioeconomic analysis as part of your EIS which tells about the local hiring and impact in the local economy? Yeah. So, you know, that um, the, for the pipeline, the, the, there's a you know, short-term benefit from the construction jobs. There's not a lot of pipeline permanent jobs uh, because of all the automation. Um, and so I don't remember off the top of my head, I think there's a lot of taxes for the county. Um, and, and those benefits during construction, there's the, you know, the, the uh, the multiplier on every dollar spent, you know, the construction contractor needs to have lodging and liability. You know, so, so there's that, that multiplier effect. And that will be Would you have like a permanent monitor of the pipeline through the county? There's the, the annual room taxes for the facility itself, is a, it's an it's a, it's a annual taxes. But we'll have some operations folks. There just aren't that many. I mean, it's not going to be a significant number. Yes, ma'am. 
I'm curious about the land use process. Are you, are you going to have to get the land use application for the county? Um, Jackson County actually, the county code exempts for accredited projects. Okay. The yeah. only county of the four we go to that, where that exemption is actually a part of the code. So that's, that's the, we're not going through a conditional use permit process, um, but where building permits would be needed for anything, yeah. if anything, then we, we would get those ability. What would be the length of time from the onset of construction to the completion of the, the uh, length pipeline? The, the start to finish is a, it's a planned two year project construction. Um, it's kind of phased year one that initially would be in the in water work in Coos County and Haynes Inlet, and, and probably because of the canals in Klamath County. It's probably going to be an overwinter construction. So uh, to, to try to get built through the canal country and the canals aren't being utilized for irrigation. Um, in year one for the rest of the project, which would be Jackson, Douglas, and the balance of Coos County, uh, the first year is timber removal. Some pipeline construction in year two is completion. You go two directions at once or just one Actually, uh, the term of art in the pipeline business is spread. This project will be built in five spreads, so basically it will be five separate projects. Um, six if you count the end water work in its own spread. So it will be about five 50 mile projects ongoing. So basically maybe multiple contracts, most likely will be multiple contracts. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big effort. That's why it takes, we're going to have a pretty healthy land team during construction because we got to you know, go out there and make sure all the owners know. Because while it's two years, it can be, we can be out there and clear the trees in year one and not be back for a whole year till the following year. And then it'll be out there for six weeks. And then, you know, I mean, there, there's gaps sometimes in, in different, there's, there's, you know, you got to clear, you got to dig the trench, you got to, you know, so there's a lot of different processes. And so sometimes there, there's gaps, and so we, we keep the landowners informed about what's going to happen and when. And uh, I mean, we, we, uh, when we get the temporary easements, we, we, we get it for, for the whole time. So that, that you know, if, if we're not using it, that's great. But if we are, you know, we, we paid for it. So uh, they're not any more, you know, uh, um, inconvenience than they already are. So, um, does anyone have any other questions? Otherwise, I appreciate your time. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask for a moment here. Uh, my name is Glenn Archambo. I'm from the Pipeline Safety Trust Board. And you guys, of course, can't say this, but I can. I know this project is going to go through. It's a done deal. Um, so, something that's in progress here, and I've watched communities across the nation have tracked this project before it was public is that it's difficult for communities to go from an opposition point of view, which Jackson County and other counties have been, as the state of Oregon has been a complete opposition group. And at some point, when the certificate is issued by FERC, then legally this is going to change and we're going to move into the development construction phase. And that's hard for communities to do. They struggle at that. Jackson County's history in the last major interstate pipeline, it was a terrible record of making that transition. Can you kind of cover how Williams is going to adapt to that social economic condition as this, this community adapts to, to being a, really an international player in the energy market? Because you've got to remember, and folks, if you guys don't understand this, the momentum economically here is enormous. There's no one in this room or state that's going to stand in the way of this project at this point. It's, or that part's done. So it's how well you adapt is the next question, which takes a lot of cooperation. So yeah, yeah. I, do you I, understand what yeah, I'm saying? I, I think so. And, and we have, um, George Angerbauer was going to be here, but we have a, a public outreach uh, group that their job is basically to come out to the community and talk to the community about those exact things. And throughout the project, and as the project progresses, George's group is very important, and he's going to have people working for him, and he's going to come out. And he's going to do presentations to different groups in the county and, and you know, the um, local business groups and things and talk about the impacts of, of, of how the project is going to impact the community. And, you know, me, I'm more of a subject matter expert. And 
But what he does is he gathers the subject matter experts like Randy and I, and we give him input, but he's the public guy who comes out and, and helps the community understand what, what the big picture is. So I, I think that is something that is kind of new. Like, we're not the only pipeline <coughs> company that does it, but it's relatively new, where you actually have a group that that's all they do, is come out to the community and talk about how the pipeline's gonna impact the community. And I think it's a great addition because it is, it is an important thing. And, and I think Williams and other pipeline companies have noticed that issue. And so we're putting a lot more effort into community relationships. You know, um, in the past, like you said, at some point the project becomes a done deal and then the pipeline company just builds the project and then tries to be as quiet as possible and, you know, out of sight, out of mind. But now pipeline companies are kind of more to that, you know, we want to be part of the community and we want people to know and, and, and we're an important part of the community and, and we should have a place in the community. So I think that's a good change for our industry in general as we're kind of coming out of the, the back row and kind of trying to move up uh, into the crowd a little bit and actually, you know, let everyone know we're there. So I think that's an important step. Um, do you have another presenter? Uh, no. Dean was here for for construction questions and he kind of helped out, but I don't know that he has. Do you have any? Uh, nope. Okay. So the one question I had is that will we have a chance to see the draft EIS of this committee? Yeah, uh, yeah, we could provide you a copy like of that. See it? Sure. Sure. Um, October, so it's yeah. It will be uh, published by FERC. I know they'll, they'll mail out hard copies. Um, I don't know off the top of my head uh, if the county, the county, county will probably get yeah. one. Yeah. I, I was going to recommend that sure. somebody, at least one person at the county, you can go to the FERC website and you can register with this project. And then every time something is put on the, the FERC website or register for this project, you get an email notification with a shortcut and you can click on it, it goes right to it. And then if that one person, I mean, we'll get you a copy, but I always recommend to the county that somebody in the county government should should register to the, the project, the FERC register, so that way they always get an update anytime someone is po something is posted, so you can kind of stay in the, in the know. Because we do our best to let everyone know, but you know, these days with websites, you can find out two seconds after it's posted, so. You know. Okay, one, one question. Um, with regard to firefighting, will the pipeline right away be accessible uh, for fire equipment? Or fire? We have such a fire hazard right now, and access is becoming more and more problematic with the loss of roads uh, in the forest. It just seems like that might be an actual type of uh, our operations folks, like like Randy, I mean, we're, we're big. Once the operations folks move in, they're big on doing that kind of stuff. Uh, our Williams operations is. Uh, the right of way won't. Uh, the right of way will not. Yeah, if the topography here is so rough that the right of way, the, the pipeline right of way itself, is not going to be something we could utilize in the transportation. But if you guys need to cross the right of way, the operation folks will be there to. to Help, help the firefighters know where they can cross We stuff. do have some enhancement stuff that we're going to do with some roads in cooperation with a few of the agencies. But as far as the right-of-way, we're regulated by what we, the condition yeah. we leave that in. Yeah, exactly. And, and most of the regulation is making it unpassable. One, one thing the project's done actually to deal on the Forest Service is they, they recognize that this pipeline right-of-way is going to make a natural fire break. Exactly. And so they designed some mitigation projects, which we are paying for, uh, doing some commercial thinning and other things to eliminate the fuel loading to make the fire break more functional. It won't be all clear, but there's there's quite a few Forest Service and Union mitigation projects that are designed that are going to occur adjacent to it, on their lands adjacent to it. But I also know our operations folks get very hands-on with the local firefighting groups and they do discussions and, and I mean they have yearly plans where they're scheduled to go out and meet with all the local firefighting agencies and stuff and I'm sure that's one of the topics they discuss is, is about communication so that way if the need to get fire equipment across the right of way arises that they can work with the local guys to, to make sure it gets done safely. Well, Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We appreciate it.
there's so much to do. Find out what that acronym is. So. No. Yeah, that's, that's I even, the toughest part right now. I emailed the guy. <laughs> He's told me before. I don't remember. Nothing on the website told me. Oh, well. I tried to put the light back in down there, but I said, I he has an email back, and I know he's in the office, but probably got his, doesn't have his mail on the